trees that palms are off? Yes. Yes. Sorry, I'm just waiting for the for the for everyone to be stationed. In their place. Sorry. No worries. Am I good? Yes, we're good. Hi, Dr. Keneally. I know that cancer is a topic that you're very passionate about. Why are you so passionate about ending cancer? What is it about cancer that is so destructive for not only people, but families. Right. Well, first of all, um, the journey, I didn't pick the journey, the journey picked me. <laughs> so it came in a letter when I was about 16 years old, and I was born in Houston, Texas. And my parents one day wanted to shop to me after school, and they told me that the drug that my mother took when she was pregnant in the 50s they found out many years later caused cancer and hormone problems and anatomical problems. And so they said that I needed to get further evaluation. And I lived close to one of the ivory towers of cancer treatments, and I started going to get evaluated. And evaluations included pap smears and biopsies and lots, it, it was a t teaching institution, so lots of Lots of uh, people peering on you, asking you questions and everything. And of course, at 16, you don't go to the doctor, right? So it was a daunting experience. And uh, after that, I knew that at that year I wanted to be a doctor. I, I loved biology. I loved chemistry. But I didn't think I could sit in the lab and be with Bunsen burners all day. So fortunately, I went to college and got my degree in biology and decided I wanted to go to medical school. I was fortunate enough to go to medical school and I finished medical school. And with that knowledge, I really thought, okay, why do I have the problems and the consequences of a drug? And I needed to unfortunately deal with that. I went to doctors, and the doctors always have a pill for every ill, as we know. And pills don't fix, drugs don't fix everything. In fact, usually they make the body worse because all drugs disturb the mitochondria, which are the powerhouse engines of your cells. And so over the years, and different kinds of episodes of issues, I decided to take health in my own hands and said, you know what, I'm going to go research myself, everything I can find. So I did, and that is where it has led me today. And fortunately, I had patients who were very curious about treatments that we didn't necessarily learn in medical school. It could have been about biologically identical hormones. It could have been about herbs. It could have been about nutrients. Now, I, you have to know that I started my practice 33 years ago with a nutritionist in my practice. And very shortly thereafter, I hired an acupuncturist to work with me. So I've been in the field of integrative functional biological medicine a long time. But I tell people, I was fortunate enough to go to medical school to really, really know how the body works. You take anatomy and physiology and biochemistry, and biochemistry is where it's all at. That's where we find the root causes of all the medical problems. But the doctors of today, I think we've kind of forgotten about the biochemistry of the body. But now I think people are really searching for the root cause. Now my situation was, was unique, but I always tell people, I'm not only a doctor, that I've been a patient for most of my life. And it has revealed to me 
something and the knowledge and the information that no medical book could ever teach me. So when I see a patient, I really understand where they're coming from very differently because I have had very many health challenges. Now, I know it doesn't look like it today, but it's, it's not about judging what someone looks like. It's really what's going on inside of somebody. Absolutely. And so, you know, I always say, tell people your mess becomes your message, and it does, because you're passionate, because you want people to know what you know. You want people to know the knowledge that they can have to create the innate healing that the body has. Just like you, Jordan. Jordan, I've known you a long time, and, uh, and you had your own healing crises and epiphany and and resolution of your healing. And so so it's there is no better teacher than going through it yourself. No book could describe, even though you try to describe to people, but it's indescribable the second by second version of what goes on when you are suffering. And but there is no better teacher either. <laughs> So. Absolutely. And I know that when you are seeking help, having someone who's been through what you've been through, in addition to treating, diagnosing, etc., is pretty amazing. So when it comes to cancer, this is a subject, a topic that affects everybody, whether it's a loved one, whether it's yourself. The statistics are daunting. They're not getting better. And when you dissect the statistics, it appears they're getting a lot worse. And so when it comes to cancer, there's an issue with an incidence of cancer and then a recurrence of cancer. And I'm guessing because you being an integrative, functional and biological doctor, you're getting people that have already tried conventional treatments, radiation, chemotherapy, surgical procedures. Uh, let me ask you this, as a percentage of your cancer patients, what percentage would you say are newly diagnosed and they're coming to you as a primary first response versus a recurrence and they've been given a death sentence by the rest of their oncologists, doctors, etc. That makes it a lot harder if, if the latter is your higher percentage. Right. Well, I would say that a lot of our patients come to me after the fact that they've been diagnosed, they've been treated, and now I'm their last resort. Yeah. And so, but the good news is now I am seeing people who as soon as they get diagnosed, they want to see me, what do I need to do, and what's the course I need to follow, and they discuss all the options with me as opposed to just surgery, chemo, and radiation. I tell people, no matter where you are, you need to prepare your mind and body for all, whether it's a biopsy, whether it's surgery, chemo, or radiation. And so that's what people don't understand. And doctors do not properly give an informed consent of what a biopsy, surgery, chemo, or radiation will do to their body. And more importantly, it's our job as physicians to help guide the patient so that they do not suffer any of the consequences and problems. Makes sense. Well, if somebody comes to a practitioner such as yourself first, I'm sure the percentage of success is greatly escalated, but clearly, most people are trained to immediately go to their primary care physician, then a referral to their oncologist, or if it's a subspecialty, depending on the area of the body or the system that is affected, makes it a sort of standard course. In other words, when your car breaks down and you have an issue, you go to your mechanic. Most people don't ask a lot of questions of their mechanic. He tells them or she tells them what's wrong. They fix it. Medicine shouldn't be that way, and you're trying to make medicine more of a partnership between doctor and patient versus the dictatorship that's been set up. So with that being said, I assume when it comes to radiation, chemotherapy, and surgery, I know this rather, they're not all created equal. It isn't that chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery are not effective or uh, there's blanket statements made that they don't work or they always work. It's somewhere in between, but there's various forms and various uh, prescribed avenues. ways to take chemotherapeutic agents. There's coadjuvants that you can use as well. And there's various surgical procedures. And I know in my own research, usually institutions and practitioners will recommend a type of chemo, a type of 
radiation and or surgery that they are equipped or their center that they work with is equipped to provide. Whereas if you do your own research, there may be a laparoscopic surgical procedure that requires much less downtime. There may be a, a chemotherapeutic agent that is much less toxic, et cetera. Talk to us about the black and white nature that conventional and integrative medicine have or, or picture they've painted when it comes to chemo, radiation, and surgery. And what is your perspective on those three conventional areas of treatment? All right, so first of all, that may be an option. For example, let's talk about a simple breast lump for a patient. So first of all, we want to prepare the patient for the biopsy even, because we know that seeding can take place. So we give the patients a pre preparation protocol for them to have that biopsy, okay? So in case something happens, they already have a fighting stance, okay? Now, if they are going to have a lumpectomy on a small one or two centimeter lump, then they need to also make sure the matrix of their body and their foundation of their body is well. So what does that look like? Well, first of all, what medical problems do they have now? Do they have diabetes? Do they have high blood pressure? Do they have autoimmune? All of that should be fixed before you have surgery, okay? You shouldn't be jumping into surgery without compromising health, with compromising health challenges. All that should be fixed. So all of your blood needs to be uh, uh, analyzed, not just a chemistry and a CBC. What is your hemoglobin A1C, which is a reflection of your sugar over 90 days? If your sugar is high, are you gonna heal well? No, of course not, whether you're pre-diabetic or diabetic. Do you have inflammation? Checking your CRP, the C-reactive protein, checking your vitamin D levels, checking your hormone levels, checking the tumor markers, all of these things. And I tell you, I see patients all over the world and they do not have a panoramic view of their blood work. Do they have good liver function? Do they have fatty liver? Do they have good kidney? Are they in ki early kidney failure? All these things. And the reason is a lot of doctors don't do it is because there's no drug for those things. So if there's no drug, they don't need to check it. For example, CRP, C-reactive protein, which is a non-specific marker for inflammation, is there a drug for it? No. The, what, what gets rid of CRP, C-reactive protein inflammation, are omega oils either fish or, or vegetarian. Also curcumin can help, also systemic enzymes can help, also purification can help, also getting rid of bugs out of your body can help. So of course, then that goes the next step, the doctors don't know how to find all that. So that, that, that is where we are really failing in conventional medicine. We're just looking at the bare superficial and not addressing the true matrix foundation that I should make sure, just like if you're gonna build a house, you don't just start with, okay, we're gonna just start putting up uh, planks and, and put nails and put wood up. No, you go, you meet with an architect, and you partner with the architect, tell me what you'd like. Tell me what kind of house you'd like. Okay, and then give me some more specifics. And you draw a design. You, you, you draw this beautiful architectural design, and then it goes through very, very, very many steps, lots of years, lots of thinking, lots of ideas, right? Well, our body is way more complicated than any house that we're building. Why don't we have the same regard and respect for this magnificent miracle that we get to have every single day? The other thing that we do in addition is that everyone gets a nutritional assessment. They, we, we actually check all their vitamins, their minerals, their toxicity levels, their heavy metal, do they have good antioxidant? Do they have a good gut or not? If all of that is not fixed first, there's no reason for you to be jumping into any procedure, doing any chemotherapy or radiation because you don't even have the foundational matrix to get through those procedures, much less fight the illness. So we're going about this. Now a patient's diagnosed with cancer. Oh, let's schedule you, do the biopsy, do surgery. Boom, your, your case is scheduled. And then, oh, you may need chemotherapy. Okay, so we'll get you. There is nothing. The World Health Organization publishes the, that the cause of all diseases, 80, excuse me, not all, about 80 to 90% is what you're eating and your lifestyle. What doctors address that with the patient? 
What doctors? <coughs> Excuse me, I've been holding a cough, so sorry. It's nope. the best I could. I'm nope. going to grab another cough drop, but hopefully that was almost a good answer complete. Sorry, I'm so sorry. I was like, my eyes are watering. That's all right. Forgive me. That's all right. No, that's all right. Where's my backpack? <coughs> oh, there it is. Sorry about that. Yeah, I was I was playing really well just until that last We're second. Great. Yeah. Did you complete your Dr. Keneally, do you want to finish or do you want me to ask yeah. another question? Uh, what, what was my yeah. last little thing I said? Uh, I was, I was oh, what doctors? What, yeah. Uh, yeah, what doctors uh, talk about? Um, okay, let me make sure I'm free of coughs. Yeah, I was going to cough at the break, but I couldn't quite hold it. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. Hang on, it's, I've done this before. Okay. All right, we're still rolling. All right. So I'll go back with. So. Yeah, so, so doctors. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So doctors must engage in these lifestyle and eating issues. I know that, unfortunately, medicine today is get them in and get them out yes. because, because they have these electronic medical records now, and you have to fill out every little thing, and you're, it's mandatory that you fill out every little thing. But it's really nothing pertinent to the healing of the right. patient, and that's that's a problem. And so, fortunately, I I that is just like you said earlier, the patient and the doctor they're partners, and I always tell the patients that I work for you, and you are my partner. And I always tell them I joke with them. I go, look, I don't want you to make me look bad. <laughs> So, so that so that really is that like they that they take that very seriously, right? Because if we were partners in anything, we we wouldn't want to make each any neither one of us look bad. So, but but uh, let's going back to so if you're going to have a procedure, and that goes for a cosmetic procedure, Jordan. It's not just for for breast cancer or any other kind of cancer. So, so the, the, the doctor needs to make sure that everything is optimal in your health, period. That's what he or she should do before you jump in and do an injurious, immune depressing procedure and emotionally challenging procedure. So yes, there's a place for surgery, okay, because why? Tumors are immunosuppressive. So we want to get that tumor out. but. It also has a nice nest before you do the surgery. So we want to make sure that the patient is in homeostasis in all regards so that the surgery is a success. So for example, in my practice, what we do is we do all that first. I tell them, look, I would prefer that you don't do anything until I get your mind, body, and spirit prepared. So most of the patients, that really makes sense to them. And I think with anyone, it makes sense. Then, uh, and, I, and I believe emotional work is just as important as fixing all the, the abnormal lab values or fixing all the nutrition or teaching them how to eat. But also what I do is I prescribe hyperbaric oxygen before, during, and after. And why? Because it, you enhance healing very, very well. I also give them IV nutrients, including vitamin C, because we know that helps the healing of all tissues. So if the patient does that, their surgery is wonderful. But if you do surgery, you have to be checking something called circulating tumor cells, because circulating tumor cells are responsible for 95% of metastasis. And so the circulating tumor cells can only be checked in the blood. And there, people forget, now they're gonna have the same number whether you do surgery before or after. It doesn't matter. Because the only thing that kills circulating tumor cells are natural substances, like vitamin D, like vitamin C, like resveratrol, like curcumin, all these things. So it doesn't matter if you do it before or after. I ask the patient, what would you like? And they, they will decide. So the definition of cure, the definition of cure for cancer is circulating tumor cells of zero, close to, they say zero to one. Now that's in the oncology books now, today, as of 2012. Now I have never had a patient have that blood work done before they come and see me or after they have gone to another doctor. Another doctor has never suggested to them, 
oh, well, we need to check your circulating tumor cells. You were diagnosed with cancer six months ago, a year ago, last week. We need to check your circulating tumor cells because circulating tumor cells are responsible for 95% of metastasis. It only has to be a size of a millimeter or two millimeters, which is a couple of pencil lines, before it's releasing circulating tumor cells. So when you're diagnosed with cancer, we need to be concerned that there's no cancer anywhere else. Okay, and not, if people get PET scans, people think, PET scans, oh, I'm clear. Well, a PET scan can only see five millimeters and above. So everything less than five millimeters, it will not, it will not diagnose. So we, you have to have ways to look at the invisible of what our routine MRI, CTs, and PET scans can do. And so, and that's why you have to evaluate blood work. That's why you have to do all the testing. And then we also do bioenergetic testing, which is another topic. But let's go with chemotherapy. Okay, today chemotherapy has been used for probably 50 years. Okay. Chemotherapy can be beneficial if someone has stage four cancer and we've got to shrink tumor burden. Okay, because tumor burden is invading the body, totally putting outrageous impedances in the body that you have to, it might even be an anatomical impedance, but it's putting such a drag on the body. Now, the way that we do it in our clinic, we do something called insulin potentiation therapy with chemo. So we use 10% chemo with insulin. insulin. Cancer cells love sugar. And so we use insulin as the escort to bring in the chemo, sparing the other cells. Now, everyone else uses conventional chemo. Now, we use a blood test um, that is, the laboratory is in RGC, in Greece, and they call it the Greek test. The laboratory is in Greece because the doctor who is an MD, PhD in molecular genetics developed the test, and it's used in over 14 countries now. It's been around for about... 13 years, maybe 14 years, I've lost count. And they have a screening test that will tell you your circulating tumor cells. It will tell me the chemo that works. It will tell me if radiation or hyperthermia, which is heat therapy works. It will tell me all the natural things that will work. And then it tells me all the growth factors that I need to address on each patient. So it creates a phenomenal roadmap for your, how you're going to treat the patient instead of guessing. Now, for example, people don't realize this, but cancer cells are chemosensitive and they're chemo-resistant at the same time. So you could be giving chemo and not even touch the resistant cells. So in our clinic, we give you something to prevent chemo resistance like curcumin and quercetin. Yes, there are medications we use too, but we use a combo. To, for, to ensure the highest utilization rate of that chemo. Because why, when you do chemotherapy, it is damaging to your brain, your liver, your heart, your kidney, your nervous system. There isn't any system that chemo can't affect. So that's why if we, we, we plan it out and plot our, our pathway very well, we can achieve the best outcome for the patient. In today's world, the guessing work is get diminishing and diminishing. We now know, we don't have to guess, we now know what to do. So, so in, our, in our clinic, we're able to assess how good something's gonna be by using this test. Now, many doctors in the United States now use this as a roadmap to how you're going to treat a patient. So, and then radiation, I'm not a big fan of radiation. We know just from PET scans, CT scans, that these are very, very, they're, they're a poison to the cell. So if I can achieve curing a cancer or getting patients in remission without radiation, I would prefer that. Sometimes there are extenuating circumstances. So, but again, people need to understand that chemotherapy is not 100% effective. It's only probably, give or take, 40% effective. So that means a lot of cells are not killed, that your body's got to kill them. Surgery is not 100% effective because why a doctor cannot see microscopic cells. 
So usually surgery is not, that's why preparation and post-surgery treatment is so important. Then radiation is very rarely affected too. It's only somewhere between zero and 25 or 30 percent. So there's a whole crops of cancer cells that are not even affected by the radiation, but there's collateral damage and secondary cancers to worry about if you get radiation. So patients need to be informed because they're their own person. They need to know what we're really, what you're really dealing with. We shouldn't be giving expiration dates because no one knows. That's not, not anything you learn in medical school or in training how to give expiration dates. And so we need to know, if we have all the information, we can fix every single thing. Now, the one thing I will tell you that is probably one of the most powerful tools we have, and it comes from yourself, and that is how you respond and how you think about this cancer. And I did not know this early on. I didn't learn this till very late. I know personally for myself, I had some ch emotional challenges in my 40s. And I remember I had one of my staff members says, oh, you know, Dr. Kelly, I want you to go see this person. And so I said, oh, well, how could this person help me, right? And, and we also look at if we have any emotional vulnerability that we're not perfect. Yeah. Well, we're not perfect. <laughs> okay, everybody comes into this world with an emotional roadblock, okay? Everyone does. You either, because we now know that we can inherit nine generations of emotional DNA. And so as a result of that, probably the first thing we all should be doing is emotional work from very early on. That would probably be the best thing we all could do. And then we probably wouldn't make the decisions. We'd have, we would have a self-awareness that we didn't have growing up. And so, that, but that's probably one of the best things I ever did. But now today, what we, we can know and what we, how we can ascertain things and, and where we can go with emotional healing is, is powerful and unbelievable. And so one of the first things we do is we tell the patient that we will be doing emotional attunement with you first on because after eating the emotional attunement is is neck and neck because we become what we think about most of the time and most of us are not conscious of what we're thinking about most of the time a lot of us the subconscious thought is more powerful than the conscious thought so so that's why we can't say surgery chemo radiation thank you thank you ma'am like no and, and every day I encounter patients, well, I had my breast lumped pet to me, or I had it removed, I had my kidney out, and I am cured. And I said, I asked the patients, so how does the doctor know that you're cured? Like, how do you know? And I go, because he told me, and I said, well, that is, we have to have verification. And in today's world, there is verification to know if you are cured. And like I said earlier, the definition of a cure or remission is circulating tumor cells of close to zero. Now, people will say, well, can't you get circulating tumor cell tests in the United States? Well, there are laboratories in the United States. I have utilized the laboratories, but they're not accurate. So, because I've compared them to the laboratory. I've used laboratories in, in Germany. I've used laboratories in France. So I've used other laboratories because of course, to make my life easier, it would be a lot easier if I could use a laboratory here in the United States. But it doesn't, it, 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 it is not, everybody came back zero and I'm like, well, there's no way, 25 specimens and everybody came back zero. It's impossible that they would all come back zero. So, so right now, at this point in time, this is the most reliable test that I have used and comparing them with many other laboratories. Well, you've said about 10 things that are revolutionary, much like your book, uh, The Cancer Revolution. I think the emotional component is completely ignored in most conventional approaches. And I would say that bitterness and emotional trauma has almost been ubiquitous in 
cancer and autoimmune diseases that I've seen present themselves or manifest themselves in individuals, but the circulating tumor cell topic is absolutely tremendous because it's a great predictor of recurrence. But here's a great question. Somebody out there has a genetic predisposition to cancer. So say it's a female, two of her aunts have breast cancer. Her grandmother on her mother's side has breast cancer. You see a pattern. That individual who does not have a tumor present that's five millimeters, how important is it and how reliable would a circulating tumor cell test be on someone who has a history when today people are getting preventative double mastectomies based on heredity when in fact it could be possible that this circulating tumor cell test could be the answer to that. I mean, how confident are you in a circulating tumor cell test prior to a manifestation of either a solid tumor or a lesion? Right, well, let's talk about that because the, we have the cure for cancer. The cure for cancer is prevention, Jordan, okay? But medicine is not proactive, preventatively, personally, precisely. Or profitably. Yeah. Okay? So, so there is a problem. But all doctors, we wouldn't have the humongous problems we have with the healthcare system if we actually prevented illness, okay? And we had health communities that everybody worked together to help each other be healthy, okay? And we have these guidelines, and we have these available now. And so, but the cure for cancer is prevention, and we can prevent it now because I do it every single day. Well, we have designed an exclusive algorithm for prevention of cancer, and how do I do that? Well, it consists of your blood tests because I look at commonalities in patients who have Abnormality. Makes sense. One of the biggest things is if you have low thyroid function, you're higher risk for cancer. And a lot of people have thyroid dysfunction today because of the chemicals and toxins and electromagnetic fields. Then if they have low adrenals, that's your that's your hormone of stress, immune and longevity. Then if you have high CRP, C-reactive protein, the inflammation marker, then that is almost, I would say, probably over 90% of the time elevated in a patient with cancer. And that's a routine test. It's not an esoteric test because yeah. a lot of people say, well, I've never heard of it. Well, it was on the cover of Newsweek and Time 12 years yes, ago. Yes. Okay, So yes, we've all heard of it. And doctors just need to do it on every patient. It doesn't matter what their age or anything. Don't assume a 20-year-old's healthy today. And then if you look at the hemoglobin A1C, which is a reflection of your sugar over 90 days, not the random sugar, because a lot of patients are always confused. They think, oh, random sugar, oh, I'm perfectly fine. And I go, no, that was what it was for lot good for that one minute. What happened to the other 24 hours and, you know, 23 hours and 59 minutes? And so, uh, and so because we know, we know in conventional medicine that if people are pre-diabetic or diabetic, they're higher risk for cancer. So we all know these things, but we're not honoring this information and executing it with patient care because our job is to teach, educate, encourage our patients to be the best they can be. And we're not, we're just not doing that, okay? And we have to do that because the United States of America is ranks 43rd in the world now. 43rd in the world in healthcare. And we spend twice as much all in the wrong way. And we are the leader in chronic diseases, cancer, heart disease being number one, they're kind of neck and now, neck. And then third leading cause published by Johns Hopkins is errors and drugs and mistakes, okay? So that's why we need to be making major shifts in the healthcare system. But let's go back to prevention. So the prevention is the blood work. Then it is the liquid biopsy, like you said, checking circulating tumor cells on any person, okay? Because you'll know, I have lots of patients right now who come into me for prevention because like you said in the beginning, is everyone knows one degree of separation of someone who has cancer. So now everybody is much more cognizant and aware of cancer 
years ago when I was young, no one had cancer, all right? No one. There wasn't anyone you knew had cancer. Actually, not only cancer, but other, all the other right. It was the big C back then. Yes, exactly. And so, so circulating tumor cell blood tests is very easily, we call it a liquid biopsy. The other thing that you can do is we, 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 we guess you're a walking, talking 3D machine, but what we are really is a bioenergetic machine. And now we know that every cell in our body exudes photons and, and energy. And it's the energy is where the real dysfunction and disorder and the dis-ease is. So we've known for thousands of years that we have acupuncture points on our, all over our body. And if we look for the energy impedance in all the acupuncture points, whether it's this point going to your liver, this one to gallbladder, so forth and so on, we can access what the impedance in all the organs are and then fix that impedance. And I also do something, a timeline. So people think you just wake up and have cancer. No, you don't wake up and have cancer one day. From one cancer cell to tumor formations, about 10 years, give or take, depending on the cancer and depending on the situation. And so that means we have so much opportunity with a patient to prevent cancer. And that's what I'm trying to do is prevent all these illnesses, whether it's high blood pressure, cancer, diabetes, we can prevent all these illnesses. For example, let's take diabetes. Diabetes, if, if you have an elevated hemoglobin A1C, you know that that patient in three to five years is gonna have diabetes. So why aren't you educating him, at least giving them a website, something. If you're not a good at nutrition, there's, I mean, we, we, we're in the era of information. There is so much information out there and if, if multiple places are saying similar things, then you know there must be some validity to it, right? And so, I mean, like all eating plans, like all diet books that have been written, they don't say go get Oreo cookies and, and hamburger helper. None of the books say that, right? Even going back when I was a little girl, my mother always, uh, she always um, quoted Adele Davis. Adele Davis and yeah. You, yeah, so Adele Davis, and she's all about let's have a healthy family. Let's, I mean, it was great. I mean, she gave, I mean, her books are unbelievable. I mean, even today, if you were to read those books. So my, my mom, you know, I grew up eating sauerkraut and bone marrow and liver and all those things. So, so we have the information now, but it's not, it's withheld from the patient. And that is what we're all about, is letting people know the secrets of health. And it, it's just, uh, it's, not, it's not right. We need to really get back to caring about people and how they are really surviving in their life. Now, I have often thought that the incidence of cancer, or what we're calling cancer, which is really a destination of a solid tumor, is probably more of a process. And so what I like about the circulating tumor cell test or the theory is that it speaks to that. And so circulating tumor cells can eventually accumulate into a solid tumor, and then the solid tumor emits the circulating tumor cells, and so it's sort of a vicious cycle. I would think um, our body is created to function well as opposed to malfunction, and I've read over the years that many individuals would have had a cancer diagnosis, but the body resolved it through what we'd call an infection, or really the body's detoxification. The question that I would ask, because I've made a comment, if everyone in America had a traditional cancer screening with a CT scan or a PET scan or something like that, I would think 75% of Americans at one point in time would have a cancer that is large enough to show up in modern technology, but through the power of the body and the cleansing mechanism, it is therefore resolved. This idea in medicine of spontaneous remission, which means anything other than chemo, radiation, and surgery is spontaneous when you have patients partner with you and frankly, pardon my expression, they work their butts off and you work yours to get them well and they would medicine would call that a spontaneous remission. <laughs> Question is this, if you had 100 individuals who were not diagnosed with cancer that has manifested, 100 individuals that would go undetected in their cancer with all screens, 
if they take a circulating uh, tumor cell test, what percentage of, quote, healthy individuals in America, and I don't mean truly healthy, I mean average, you go to a mall and 100 people that have no cancer diagnosis, what percentage of them would show a level above zero or one on a circulating tumor cell test? Well, that's a very good question. Now, my patient population, they're always testing positive, okay? But these are people that have already been diagnosed with cancer. But on my preventive side, because I do a preventive side, I would say probably at least, probably about 30%. Okay, so 30% of people who have no, who have no cancer knowledge. diagnosis they just or come in for symptoms, a, yes. they would show some level of cancer activity or process. That is really, really important information. And I, another question I will ask you that you can't possibly answer is out of those patients that you're working with, and they, maybe they have thyroid issues, which you've said can be an underlying predictor of cancer risk. Maybe they have autoimmune disease. Maybe they have metabolic right. syndrome or prediabetes. Or, or breast cyst or something. Yeah, absolutely. That they're dealing a, a with. A myriad of conditions that people have, or they're on certain medications that lead to cancer risk for anxiety, oral contraceptives, the list or goes on and pressure. on. Massive recurrent antibiotic prescriptions. If, if that person comes into your preventive side, they have circulating tumor cell elevation, no manifestation of cancer in traditional tests. No tumor tests. manifestation, right. What percentage of your wellness or preventative program what percentage of those individuals could then reverse their circulating tumor cell test? What I'm really trying to find out and ask, doing it in a roundabout way, the pre-cancer individual, what per, how easy it is, is it to help their circulating tumor cells go down to zero versus someone who's already manifested in a tumor? I'm trying to point right. to well, how important it's prevention a, yeah, is. Yeah, it's so much easier. <laughs> It's so much easier. Yes, they've got to learn the same things because they know they're headed to a pathway of doom or, or eventually with a conventional way of diagnosing cancer because today cancer is not conventionally diagnosed with a circulating tumor cell. It's right. a breast bump sure. or lump, okay? Uh, and so it's not, it's, as you know, it's not the, the circulating tumor cell, which it should be routinely done, I think, because it's so much easier. But it's much easier because you teach the patient impeccable self-care and they take care of it themselves. Now, you are also doing the scans. So, for example, let's take, for example, I have two sisters from Texas, okay? And they both, the reason why they came, just like you used earlier, is they have a family history of multiple people having cancer. So they came to me not knowing anything, and they were seeing um, an, a gynecologist in Texas. And so I, they came to me, did phone consults first, and then they came in and to see me. And I found out one of the girls, or women, one was 40, one was 42, one had breast cancer and one had ovarian. Now they do not have, if you do the MRIs, if you do the pelvic MRIs and all the scans, there's nothing, okay, because there's nothing able to, to detect yet because they're like, they're, it's too small. Now, let me back up. So you're saying when you say they have ovarian and breast well, cancer. Well, I've discerned through all my testing okay, so what in, it in, is. According to your test, traditional diagnostics have not shown that, yeah. but you're saying that they have a process yes. of breast and ovarian cancer. Okay. Just exactly. To... Yes. They have their, that's what it's related to. Got it. So even though the test all the imaging tests do not show it, right? But I always use in my comp in my lectures, I tell people it's not the, about the top of the iceberg. That's the easiest part to get. It's what lies beneath. Now, would you say that they were in a precancerous state, or do you communicate to them that they have cancer? I tell them they're in a preventive. Okay. Pre not even precancer because you want to. I, I think that word. Oh, it's so it's so powerful. It's so impactful. It's, it's, but I yeah. tell people, I'm optimizing you. Got it. I am creating the best case scenario yes. for you. That's what, and they're they're doing it because they're the one that has to do all the work. Sure. 
But and when I say all the work, it's really not work. It's just embracing healthy living, okay? Like, for example, instead of using plastic water bottles, you're using glass water bottles. You have an air purifier. You're using non-toxic cleaning substances. And you slowly, slowly get rid of all the things that are impacting your health. Well, and that truly uh, points to the saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I suppose if somebody were to keep up with their house cleaning on a weekly basis, it's always going to be easier to clean said house. Whereas if someone hasn't cleaned their home in six months or a year, the amount of work they're going to have to do, not only with cleaning, but probably remodeling, ripping things out. If you think about it, it's a great analogy because if somebody comes in that has a clean bill of health, in other words, they have not shown an evidence of cancer in conventional tests, but yet you're finding that combination of circulating tumor cells, thyroid levels, adrenal levels, maybe liver enzymes, uh, various oh, inflammatory things. markers such as CRP, um, then they go on a program and it's more akin to the house that is regularly cleaned That's and correct. sweeping some of the stuff out. Whereas if somebody has gotten to the point where they already have a tumor that is the size of above the detection limit, then you're dealing with not only the physical issues, but the mental and emotional, which I want to talk about now. I think, um, and I've preached this many times, having understood it firsthand, when anyone receives a cancer diagnosis, and it could be a breast lump that's small enough for a lumpectomy, right? It could be the stage four metastatic. That word cancer means death to almost everybody. And I've equated it to walking into your oncologist or your specialist appointment, you've been referred by a primary care doctor, and you go in and they give you the bad news. You've been diagnosed with cancer. I literally believe people walk out of that appointment different. They're, they're walking different. It's almost like you spend the rest of your life, if you choose to, looking behind you for the grim reaper that's chasing you down. You immediately want to know how long you're going to live. And unfortunately, in the information age, you can look up one of 50 websites to see the average longevity of someone diagnosed with, quote, your cancer. And I often have believed that someone makes a decision right then and there whether, whether to live or die. All that to say that the physical side of cancer is challenging. But in my experience as a health coach, and you may agree or disagree, from a physical sense, if you remove the emotion, if you remove the stigma that cancer has, I would much rather physically and nutritionally work to help someone with cancer, particularly a solid mass tumor of some of what we've talked about, breast, et cetera, versus MS, Crohn's disease, ALS, rheumatoid arthritis. Those autoimmune type diseases, in my mind, on a physical sense, can be more difficult to completely get to the bottom of than cancer. However, there is no comparison to the emotional setback someone can have when they're given the cancer diagnosis versus a disease that, quote, won't kill them. I often say that if I scrape my elbow, I clean the wound, put some essential oils on it, and I'll bandage it. I don't give it a second thought right. that it's not going to heal. Right. You don't like, Same worry with a fracture. Right. I've got a sling. I may have to get something reset. Maybe I have a cast, but I don't spend every day thinking this is going to kill me, this is going to kill me. When you have cancer and you get a headache, you think it's spread to your brain. brain. When you have knee pain, mm -hmm. it's spread to the bone. And I, I truly believe that when you're dealing with cancer, there are two near insurmountable obstacles. I said near because there are those that overcome. And I've often described it like this. If 100 healthy people went to their primary care physician for a checkup, a physical, and out of that 100 people, they were told, surprisingly, that they have cancer with six months to live. So again, this is a healthy group of 100 people. Mm -hmm. They were told they have six months to live. They have incurable cancer. I believe 30 people die on the six-month mark. This is healthy people. Probably more than that. And, and, and well, you're saying more. Great. Well, I'm great and terrible. Oh, so here, here's another scenario. Got 100 they live people. out there. Yes, because they believe it and they mm -hmm. accept it and they yeah. manifest it. Yeah. 
as the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And worse, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So in other words, if you go around telling everyone you have cancer and you're going to die, even worse, you're, you're speaking your death sentence. Scenario number two, 100 healthy people go to their primary care physician. They don't know anything from an oncologist. They're unsuspecting. Right. They go in and they're not told anything, but they're given chemotherapy. I know this is a made up scenario. I think out of 100 healthy people that get chemotherapy, 30 might die. And this is my opinion based on all the research I've done and the people I've talked to. What do you think about that? And I know, I'm not, I know you, you use a form of chemo that is much more sensitive, more targeted, causes less side effects, but I know people that have died from chemotherapy and it isn't some secret cloaked in alternative medicine. It is a fact. No, that's true. Unfortunately, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> One of my patients, uh, she sees me, her whole family, the, all three generations see me, and she tried to bring her uncle in. He had lung cancer, and so he said, no, I'm just going to go to my conventional doctor. So she went with him to the appointment, and so the doctor, she asked the doctor, she goes, well, what are you going to do for my uncle for his immune system? And she goes, oh, it doesn't affect the immune system. He'll be fine. Well, the gentleman died after the first chemo. So she went in there. She was so upset. She went in there to the doctor and said, I thought you said that this didn't affect the immune system. My uncle died from one chemotherapy. So yes, it, 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 unfortunately, the, the statistics show that the patients, they're dying from the treatment. Right, so okay. you got 30% or more, as you said, who emotionally accepted a cancer diagnosis when they and, didn't have cancer right. and they died, and then 30 or more die from a treatment that is considered standard care. Right. It makes this mountain more difficult to climb, I should say. And so it, it really creates a complicated puzzle to solve when you're the one being counted on to help people with cancer. And so I think what you've shared about the targeted testing, diagnostic procedures are important. How you communicate with someone who has an elevated circulating uh, tumor cell test in that, hey, you don't have pre-breast cancer because that's a tough pill to swallow, but you know what? You're someone who needs to be doing X, Y, Z. You talk about various cytotoxic natural therapies, which means targeted compounds within herbs and spices, curcumin, grapeseed, OPCs, etc. Awesome. Green tea has some and so many others. So many others. And it's a way to detect early, but then truly not do any harm to patients because I think everyone would agree a, a, a prick in the, in the vein is not going to cause the same kind of harm as a biopsy would or even a mammogram would. So I think those are amazing. I think getting your emotions straight, truly amazing. What I think you said that made the most sense to me and I'm most excited about is that before anyone gets anything that's at all invasive, even a diagnostic procedure, you're having them prepare their body and address underlying issues. So instead of the traditional, or should I say conventional way, where when anything shows up, they can't schedule you fast enough for a lumpectomy, for a mastectomy, for some type of bone marrow test, or whatever right. it be, you're taking the opposite approach and saying, you know what, you can't even go there until you get nutrients, till you detoxify, till you address your environment. I think that is really, really powerful. And so I'm someone listening saying, I don't know anyone who shouldn't come see you, whether they're suspecting cancer, whether they have symptoms, whether they've been diagnosed, or whether they have a family history. So number one, I'm sold. But here's a question I'm going to ask. People in America who are diagnosed with cancer today mm -hmm. that are enlightened to alternatives, one of their first thoughts is, I need to go out of the country to an, try an unapproved therapy that is possibly being administered by someone who may not have had a level of training that would rise to the occasion of United States medical doctors. So uh, how is it that you who are a licensed medical doctor in the United States are able to not only use great diagnostic procedures that are cutting edge and should be standard of care, but the treatments such as IPT and others, people are going far and wide to Mexico, to Germany, 
to South America. I know these people. I've been to some of these clinics, uh, both from a personal standpoint and then call it a risk standpoint. How are you able to administer these therapies and why don't people know they can do this in the U.S.? Well, that's true because it's, it's one, people, uh, anything about health and prevention, it is so blinded by what is available here and what's available. Look what every TV, every periodical, every newspaper, there is nothing about health, nothing. So that's where people are getting their news. Yes, you can get things on Google and obviously if you go to Josh, I mean, go to different websites, you're going to get information, but you got to get there, okay? And, I, and it's interesting, a lot of my patients will tell me like, look, I told my friend to come and see you, but they just want to stick to their oncologist. And I said, you know what? But I work with those people too. We want to make sure that we have the best approach possible with any, whether you see the oncologist. So I work with the surgeon or the oncologist or any other specialist because I'm the quarterback for you. I'm your, I'm your quarterback. I'm working on the front lines with you. And yes, I know, first of all, medical tourism is big all over the world, okay? All over the world for lots of different reasons, okay? Whether it's dentistry, whether it's cancer, whether it's all kinds of things. Because like I said earlier, United States medicine, we're not progressing like we should be. Okay? We're going backwards, we're, it we're, we're, like. we're staying with what we did 20, 30 years ago, okay? Because if you looked at way things done 100 years ago, it's the way the things I'm doing things, which people may not think it's, it's uh, progressive, but it is. Using what we what doctors all did, they had all apothecaries before. They compounded their and own. We things. call it ancient medicine. Uh, yeah, versus ancient medicine, medicine, right? And so, but we have new modern medicine, though. The new modern medicine also is what I'm doing. Like a circulating tumor cell is modern medicine, Jordan. Okay, it, it's not alternative. It's not homeopathic. It's new modern science. Science is changing by the second. But the doctor of the today, number one, doesn't have time because I tell you that any doctor who went to a functional medicine course, it would be impossible for them to go back and practice. And I know, because I've been doing this 33 years, I fortunately had the divine direction to do the way I did it, started practicing with, with the natural things and having a nutritionist, okay, from the, from the get-go, okay? But I didn't know anything really. I look back now and I'm like, oh my goodness, what I know now, obviously 33 years later. But it's, it's the doctor today does not have the time, energy, or money, okay? They're working on filling out charts and then they're bombarded with a pharmaceutical with its side effects and issues, but they think it's a, a, a slam dunk with a, a problem because I read conventional journals along with functional medicine. I, I get in my emails, MD Edge and all the other things because I want to know sure. what is out there because sometimes we need to use conventional medicine. I, sometimes if you come in with an emergency, I don't go, okay, let me get my natural potion. I say, look, we're going to get you controlled, Jordan, with medication and or procedures or whatever we have to do to, to save your life. And that's where emergency medicine comes into play. But... I will say, why is this happening? What is the cause and effect? What is the origin of why you came in here to begin with? Like for example, I had this young lady, she was 30 years old. She had methicillin resistant staph aureus three times, three times. Now, first of all, if you get it one time, it's like, whoa, something's wrong. We better go look because that can kill you, mm -hmm. right? So someone referred her to me. I. She's 30 years old, 30 year old. Do they have medical problems? They shouldn't have medical problems, right? You should have a warranty until you're 40, right? Well, those were the olden days. Now it's 20 year olds, 25 year old, 18 year olds can have medical problems. Anyway, so she came in to see me. She was beginning stages of diabetes, vitamin D deficient, and one of her hormones was, was, was out of whack, okay? I, I, in two visits, literally two visits. I told her what she needed to do. I sent her to the nutritionist to get specific 
information on the eating program that she needed to do and never had again, and that was five years ago. And she tells me, it's kind of interesting, she sees me once a year now just for routine annual. And she says, Dr. Kennelly, it's so sad. If I could have had the, my life that I have now, 10 years ago, I would have done things completely differently in my life. That's what's so sad. But why didn't the doctor who first treated her said, look, say she went to the emergency room, this is serious. Why do you even have this? Like, this is something serious going on. You better go see someone who can do a very, very good historical outlook on you to see why you're getting this in the beginning. And that's the sad part. Is that's what we are. That's what we were trained to do. That is the way we're trained to think. Why is it that we're just giving the antibiotic? See you later. Bye. We have to care about this person's now and future. And that's, that's what's so sad, but I fixed her with just a couple of things. Like, and she never had an, a life-threatening condition again with a few, little, a few little interventions. You know, that's tragic. But look at all the people out there now today that need this knowledge and need to have, to, we all need to teach them self-care. That's what we need to do. And it's out there. But people, their doctors tell them, though, that, oh, casserole packs, herbs, no, that, no. I, I will tell you, though, things are changing. I had a patient who had a yolk sac tumor, which is a rare form of ovarian cancer, flew in from Florida, young woman, was treated conventionally. Like many times, it comes back, especially some cancers come back quickly. Because once you open up the pelvic abdominal cavity, you tend to create snowflakes in the area. And so, the, so she came to see us, and we did many things on her, hyperbaric and low-dose chemo and all the other things she did. Lots of emotional work she'd never done in her life. So I got her scans last week, and she did an abdomen and pelvic MRI, and she has, I told her, keep your oncologist. He's always, or she, is always good things to bounce off with. Luckily, he was supportive of her to do this treatment because he'd already done his surgery and chemo. It wasn't like he hadn't done it. He had his chance. So then we'd already, she came, she, her scan was clean, and he goes, you know, Arlene, in 35 years, I have never seen this. I have read Dr. Keneally's book. Now I'm going to read it with a new pair of eyes. After That's awesome. I've seen. So things are changing, they are changing, Jordan. They are. But just not fast enough now. We need the help today because we have a society that is very, very sick, and no one is taking a stand on resurrecting the health and vibration of humanity. Yes, there are people, but not enough. Just, it, there, there just isn't enough. And like I said earlier, for a doctor to go back and start learning, I know that I spoke to a doctor. I went and lectured in Louisiana, and this guy, uh, he was an, a medical doctor, and he was an ER doctor. And so he said, someone just out of the blue said, look, you know, I think you should go take this, this go listen to this doctor lecture. Well, the doctor made a lot of sense. So he goes like, well, how do I learn this? So he goes... He says it, it took him a couple of years just to download the information to his brain. So it's not something that you take a weekend course and you're an expert. Because, I mean, if you want to learn the entire uh, array of different things from energy treatments to herbs to essential oils to nutrition to fixing the gut, learning all the purification and everything, and, and then that is just not your comfort zone. Yeah. So you have to say, well, oh, let me see if this works, right? And so, so it's, but none of these things hurt people. And the Hippocratic Oath is first, do no harm. And so we need to be thinking how, as physicians, how is this going to hurt or help my patient? Well, I was going to mention something that you just brought up. The Hippocratic Oath, or Hippocrates in general, had two powerful statements. One, first, do no harm. Two, let your food be your medicine and let your medicine be your food. And I have said this before. I've been damaged by medicine, um, but 
the person who was treating me each time didn't intend to damage me. So I want to be really clear that I don't think we should hate a person who right. is uh, making a diagnosis or prescribing a treatment. We shouldn't hate a system because much like a lot of us have had loved ones or our own selves who've been diagnosed with cancer, we've lost loved ones, that is. But we've also all known someone who's been helped in an emergency or trauma scenario, which is absolutely critical. That being said, I really believe that the medical system today is set up more on the hypocritic oath than Hippocratic. I think that first do no harm, which is really something that's visible in almost every office, if not every clinic, and certainly in a hospital. I mean, that the, the sign of medicine is that. I think that um, the example you gave of someone with MRSA, even the end, no, she's well now because of food that became her medicine, detoxification, and, and lifestyle changes. Right. But yet, probably the most damaging thing she received was the treatment for the germ that, manif that, that manifested or took hold that wouldn't have done so in the first place had she learned that, I would say, a preventative lifestyle. It's really more a wellness lifestyle. We shouldn't be looking at preventing disease. We should be looking at experiencing true life. Many people live till they're 80 and they're miserable and they're chronically sick, but they would be considered by medicine as well because they don't have any serious diagnosis. It's normal to be on a dozen medications when you're 70 years old. You know what's abnormal is to be a nun. So if you're not on a medication when you're a senior, whether it's at least a cardio-related medicine or blood sugar, if you're not on uh, statins or if you're not on a blood, blood pressure. pressure or blood sugar, you're in the in the very minority. rare ab yeah, minority. And uh, I have two sides of my family, which we all do who are married. My family is um, holistic in mindset. My dad's a naturopath and a chiropractor and my parents run zero medications. My wife's parents who are from the South, my sister-in-law is a medical doctor and professor at a, at a university that is very anti uh, integrative medicine. So my, my father-in-law is on, I would guess, 15 medications. It could be 20, it could be 12, and my mother-in-law is on at least eight. Um, so, and, and I would say that that's probably average. They're in their early 70s. That's the paradigm we're in. But as you said earlier, there is some hope because there's more information now. There's more questions being asked. The medical doctors are being forced to either come out and say, the immune system doesn't matter in cancer. I hear this every day. You can eat anything you want in cancer. Sugar doesn't feed cancer. You have Crohn's disease or diverticulitis or celiac disease or ulcerative colitis, and they say it doesn't matter what you eat, which is just absolutely mind-boggling. But there are also those that get enough questions about an herb or about a diet that they go and research. And so I think beyond your ability to treat patients with natural, I don't even want to call them medicines, but we'll call them uh, natural tools, powerful tools. I think, and I've said this often, our job is really to be a purveyor of hope more than it is a slinger of turmeric or grapeseed or uh, colonics or whatever that be. And so I think a um, couple of things I'm taking away from our time together, number one, is that no matter who you are or where you are, you need to be on a wellness plan. And if you have any reason to believe that you are at risk for cancer or disease, go to Dr. Keneally or someone to have an analysis That's of right. not only the blood work you've had over the years, but getting tests that really are predictive based on a combination of published articles and journals and then just your experience seeing how many cancer patients do you keep track i mean is there well, thousands is it well, thousands yeah thousands. so thousands so you've seen thousands and you've compared their thyroid their adrenal panels you've compared their their a1c so you look at that so that's really important but also i think that anyone who's watching there's hope and and oh, in terms of where you go and, and medical tourism orange county is a pretty good place to go visit i think so i'm encouraged that someone like you is fighting the good fight, I can tell everyone who's watching personally that the last thing that a human being would want to do is be involved emotionally 
with, with a cancer patient. In other words, no one chooses to do that for fun. It is a labor of love, mm -hmm. but it is a labor. I have coached hundreds of people on all manner of incurable diseases, lots on cancer, and it you are so emotionally and intertwined with that individual. When they get a test or a follow-up scan, you're, you're waiting for the call, you're waiting for the communication. So I know that um, despite what people might think, oh, being a doctor is great. Being a doctor who treats patients with incurable diseases is one of the hardest things to do on the planet, number one. And, and number two, uh, to do it and actually be on the forefront of this battle against conventional wisdom, conventional medicine. Again, people that are diagnosed have family members weighing in and calling integrative practitioners various names. I, I applaud you for that. So I am thankful for you and others like you that are not only places that people can go to have safe, effective intervention, but they can receive hope. And you've said earlier no one is qualified, and I would say it should be criminal to give someone an expiration date. I think that it is absolutely a curse when a authority figure tells you how long you're going to live. So I think um, all that together uh, makes me very excited about what you're doing in your clinic, but also the Cancer Revolution book is something that individuals can read and they can find a doctor, hopefully in their area, that practices this type of medicine. And if they are not at a point where they want to do that, they can learn from the book proven techniques to aid in their wellness and therefore fight off not just cancer, but okay. bacteria, oh, yes. okay. thyroid issues, hormone imbalances, etc. So I'm pretty sure that buying the Cancer Revolution book is a great investment, probably a zero risk investment. But I also think that uh, you certainly have my endorsement for people to travel far and wide to Orange County, California, which most people want to visit anyway, to see you. And I've known you for over 20 years, which is hard to believe. And I'm really excited to see where your practice has gone. When we first talked, you did not have all this information. You didn't have these case studies. You didn't have these amazing testimonials. And it it is so exciting to me to have a resource such as yourself and your clinic and your team, because I get asked every day, where is someone in this area or that area or my town who can give me hope of a life beyond this diagnosis? So right. I, I want to uh, tell those who are watching that I am a fan and I'm also a believer in Dr. Keneally, her work, her books, her clinic, and uh, I am someone who will enthusiastically recommend anyone who asks me, what can I do dealing with cancer? But also so many other conditions. So I'm excited for um, what you do and I really hope your colleagues will listen and I certainly hope uh, you will continue to have patients coming in droves to get real answers for their real problems in a holistic way. Right, well, you're right. And it, like I said, the good news, it's changing. For patients, patients are coming in preventively or as the beginning of their diagnosis. Doctors, I had a, it's interesting, I had a doctor that works as a hospitalist. A hospitalist is a doctor who spends all his time in the hospital taking care of. Sounds terrible, yeah. by the way. Uh, yeah. So anyway, he recommended his sister to come and see me. And I said, well, how does your doctor brother even know me? He goes, well, I, he was trying to help me find a doctor. He says, no, go to her, this girl, this lady. So he, she comes in. And so I said, well, have your brother come in. And, and see the clinic and, and see what we do so he truly understands and can properly take it all in and endorse it, you know, and maybe he can learn from it as he's taking care of patients in the hospital. So he came in, did a tour and everything. So he says, well, can I just shadow you one day? So he comes in and shadows and he says, I want to work here. <laughs> this is how I want to practice medicine. He goes, I've read little, you know, I've, I've taken a few courses. He goes, I'm not anywhere near where you guys are, but I am willing to learn and to embrace and completely change careers in my life. Wow, so, what a blessing. So that's like, so that's like, see, there is. And we, we talk about hope individually. We have, we have to have hope in our system, and, and I do. We did a whole thing on hope this past week. 
And, and you're right, everybody needs to know that there is something. I was at an international medical laser conference uh, about a month or so, two, go, two months ago maybe, and we were looking about how medical lasers, uh, how we can treat everything from car uh, cancer to Parkinson's to everything. And the doctor there was from Germany, and he has a big clinic in Germany that they treat a lot of cancer, but other things. And he said, if someone comes into you breathing, there's always something you can do. Absolutely. So, and, and, and we can't ever give up on ourselves and other, others. And I, I was trying to think of the best acro acronym to say for hope, and, and I, it's heavenly options prevail eventually. Heavenly options prevail eventually. Yes, and so that's how we have to think, that there is always an invincible solution out there. We may just not know it, but we can use the, the, the universe to access everything we know. That's awesome. Excited to be talking to you. And as I said, I uh, enthusiastically support what you're doing. And I, I will be praying that you have uh, a renewed sense of purpose every single day because we need not just you yes. but we need more of you more so soldiers, very right. excited so great to be with you and i look forward to uh, speaking with you in the future and hearing more of the great testimonies and lives that are being changed every day uh, through your work that's uh, really amazing well thank you jordan for being part of our journey today oh, that was so good oh that was great jordan I want you to come to I, what, what, did I, what did I do? I was just listening. I was just listening. No, that was great. It was great. This was perfect. It was great. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that is very exciting. And he's been through it. He had his, uh, you know, his own uh, things going on. That's why he knows. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, let me, let me oh. get this out first. Do you want to cough or anything? No, I actually am good. One cough is enough. And you can use the colloidal salt.